Hi everyone, um, I'm Ian. Welcome to THU TV from Trojan Horse Was a Unicorn. Uh, I'm here all week uh, from 10 a.m. on Portugal time chatting about visual effects and animation. And today I've got a really great guest to start with. It's Ian Spriggs. Hey Ian, how Hi. you doing? Good, how are you? It's great to meet you. I only just met you two days ago. That's right. How have you been going so far at THU? Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Crazy experience. A lot of late nights, but it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> we might get you to come closer to the microphone. That's yeah, right. sure, but, no problem. Um, for those of you who, for those out there who don't know who you are and your work, um, and I can't wait for people to look into that a bit more because you do some incredible CG portraits and you've been doing some amazing work at Oat Studios, yeah. which is Neil Blomkamp's studio. Can you give everyone a bit of an idea about what your job is and how you describe your role when someone asks that question? Uh, so, I'm, yeah, I'm usually just like the character artist, so I usually just do the modeling and text drink. So that's, so like for my job, that's like my, like for Neil, that's what I do. And I, any creatures or any ideas he has like that, it's like my job, it's like the organic modeler. Yep. And then per, like my personal work is the portraits on the side. How did those portraits come about? Because they're these sort of mix of like photo real things of pe people who are well known and some who aren't. Um, but that use, you know, tools that everyone uses each day, like, will you tell me? That's uh, quite a big question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I started them in like in 2014. So it's like I done, like a lot, all my personal work is like kind of political and I was like, I wanted to get it more personal. So I started off with my self portraits. I just wanted to kind of like focus more on like, like closer things to myself. And then I did my family. And it's like, I was always doing character designs, but it's like, I never always, I never had the chance to push them as far as I wanted to. So I, the self-portrait is like, well, I, it's personal. I can spend as long as I want on it. So I can actually push it as much as I want. Yeah. How do you actually do them? Are they, you know, are you modeling from scratch? Are you using photogrammetry? Are you using photo reference? You know? uh, so I model from, from scratch, but usually I have like a base mesh, like a really low base mesh, which I've rigged and I'll pose. Yeah. But the, I think like the trick is just like I have so much photo reference. Yeah. Like I'll do like a two hour photo shoot of like all my subjects and so I'll do like change the lighting, change the poses. I usually like I'm inspired by like the masters, like Rembrandt's. So I'll find a an image I like which I've done in the past and I'll try to like mimic it sometime. Not it's not copying it, but but let it inspire me. So I'll try different lighting like like that and then yeah, I'll just do like, I'll have like hundreds of photos and then I'll start working based on the, on the photos. Is there a time that it takes you to do one of these or does it just depend on how much free time you have? Usually it takes like two to four months, but it depends. Like some, like the portrait I did of Neil, he's got his hands, he's like on his knee in front of him. Yeah. And I was like, hands are just as complicated as the face. <laughs> and they're even more expressive sometimes. And yeah. it's like, it's just, wait, it's more time yep. to, do, to do the hands. So stuff like that will add time. But it's usually two to four months. I seriously recommend people go and check out your website, which is? Ian Spriggs at, uh, dot com. Yeah, yeah. for um, like high res looks at these portraits. They're yeah, incredible. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about oats because that's been getting so much attention with what Neil's been doing because it's a very different visual effects company, in fact, filmmaking company, really. Yeah. Um, but before we go there, just tell people what where you got started and you know what sort of companies and projects you've worked on. Uh, so, so I started. I went to Seneca in Toronto. Uh, that's 2006, and then I got a job at uh, Stars Animation. So I was oh, yeah. just learning like the basics, like. It's so, like we did a lot of cartoons, like Nomeo, Nomeo and Juliet. Yeah. So I started there, and then I broke into the visual effects side of things at uh, Mr. X in Toronto. And then, uh, yeah, about three years ago, I moved to Vancouver, and then I worked at like ILM, Scanline. And then uh, that's when Neil reached out to me. I guess he's, I think he saw my work on ArtStation. Right. And then he just reached out to me and asked if I wanted to be a part of this, this new project. Yeah. When he actually emailed me, I thought it was like a spam. I was like, this, is, this can't be true. <laughs> that's not Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not Neil. <laughs> I, I love that he probably was looking at ArtStation, and that is an amazing place to put material and oh, to yeah. find great artists, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Neil's always looking at ArtStation. Oh, like right. he, uh, some of the, the ideas he had for Oats, like he'll be looking at ArtStation, and if he li likes an idea, he'll contact that artist and say, can I buy this idea for you? Right, so. amazing. Oates is Neil's idea about uh, creating his own stuff 
away from the studio system, yeah. doing shorts and getting them out there for people to see and comment on. But I'm interested when he approached you and it was a secretive thing, what made you say yes? Uh, well, uh, so I was... I needed a job. <laughs> <laughs> I got an email originally from Chris Harvey, who's the CG super, uh, visual effects supervisor. Yeah. And he was like, you know, I can't even explain to you what the job is. Just come to the studio. Okay. And I was like, okay, this is... And this is in Vancouver, right? This is in Vancouver. Yep. So I, I go to this place called Richmond, Vancouver. And it's like this weird, like, there's nothing there. There's just a couple warehouses. And I, was, I swear, I thought I was in the wrong spot. And I walk up to this warehouse. I, it looks like it's going to be demolished in, like, any, any day. But I see a really expensive car outside. I'm like, maybe this is the yeah. right space. Yeah. I go into the studio, and it's like the, the moose from Chappie. Yeah. It's like 25 foot tall. It's just stood there. As soon as you open the door, it's just like looking at you. This is the big robot made by Weta Workshop, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like all the Chappie robots all along the side of the wall, all the props. And it's like, it's just props and like toys and like robots. And it's like, and then Neil comes out. He's like, Ian. I love your portraits. And I was like, I'm sold. I, really? want, I want to work for you. And what did you know about it going in? And what were some of the first things that actually happened as it ramped up? Uh, I didn't really know much about it before, okay. before that. Like people told me like Neil's opening a studio, but no, it was like big hush hush. Nobody knew anything about it. Yeah. But yeah. And, and so what, what did that then actually mean in terms of production and what you would be doing there as a, as a modeler or, or creative person? Uh, well, what, what was the first thing you did? First thing I did was I modeled a giant okay. for one of the shorts. Like we did so much work in those two years, uh, yeah. we didn't actually show all of it. Oh right. Like when the stuff we released, we probably only released like half the stuff we did. So it's like all the like I've made so many I've made more assets in that two years than I have in my entire career. Really? And it's like, so the stuff I was working on, it's like some of the things are like, well, we don't have time for this. We've we got to focus on these shorts instead. Right. The first short was Racker. That's right. Right? Yeah. So what did you do for Racker? Uh, so I modeled the, the, the Racker alien. Yeah. It's called a, a Clume. So I modeled that thing. Yeah. So if people haven't seen it, it's all online and, and free and you can watch it. But basically it's about an alien species that seems to come to Earth dominate some cities, yeah. um, but sort of people on Earth fight back, including yeah. Sigourney Weaver, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was pretty, it was super fun to work on that one. Yeah. What was particularly challenging about the, the Clume creature? Uh, the, we had to, do a, had to do a couple uh, head variations of different designs. So it took me, I was the first time I ever did any like concepts. Like I, I'm usually digital, like digi doubles, like human figures, but yeah. then Neil's like, well, you're a character artist, you got to do creatures too, so we need you to do some head variations, yeah. so I did some concepts for that, that was quite challenging, because it was new to me, but I loved it, and then we found one we liked, so that was quite challenging, and then uh, there's this black wax, which goes over the clumes. Yeah, like a liquidy ink type thing, isn't yeah, it? That yeah, that was quite challenging for the, uh, some of the effects artists to deal with. Right. It ended up looking pretty cool, but I, I don't know. Throughout the process, I was, I was like, I don't know. Maybe they should. Maybe they should get rid of it. Oh. But in the, like, they pulled it off in the end. I was like, that's nice work. Because that that inky stuff also makes its way to like a human character, doesn't it? In who has a head implant or something like that. Am I remembering? So the black wax is kind of like the the clumes can mold it to anything they want it to yeah. be. Like it can be a spaceship or it can be like a tool, like an operating tool. So they can kind of use it that way. So that's what they use to open that guy's skull up and implants. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so you worked on that and that was a hit. I mean, I think it was on, on yeah. YouTube. Um, and then the next one was Firebase. But I actually want to skip to Zygote because your uh, modeling and uh, texturing and design on that crazy multi-limbed character has been like, you know, totally praised. It's all over Twitter, it's all yeah. over the internet. How complex was that to do? It was pretty complex. <laughs> it was, I can't remember how many people were attached. I think it was like 68 people all attached to each yeah. other. And it's like, I was just, 
just to figure out like how to do it and make it possible for the rigger. Like it's easy just to sort of like done it in ZBrush and just like dynamesh it all together, but then you gotta make sure it's all like cleaned up and it's like ready for production. It's gotta make sure I don't want to be like texturing each end separately. Yeah. So I had to think of like workflows, how, how to actually get it, do, get it done. What do you remember was the comment that Neil or, or the team said, this is what the character needs to be, go away and do it. Like what was the overriding principle of Zygo? Uh, so Neil's very, like he didn't want it to look like the thing. Like he yeah. didn't want it to be like alien. He wanted it to look like human. And he's like, I want humans with like no no faces, just body parts. And I want it to feel like it's it's stitched together. So he wanted it to be like, uh, as if it, I don't know, I guess if it could have worked. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I'm interested also in what you think Oats is doing differently. You've worked in a couple of visual effects studios, you know, big ones, ILM, Mr. X, MPC, I think. Yeah. Um, what What is, apart from the obvious, which is it's his own stuff, what is the ph different philosophy at Oats? <laughs> from your point of view. It's like there's so many different, different things yeah. about Oats. Uh, so it's like, if I have a, if I'm working on an asset and I want to get a revision, I don't have to go through all these steps. I, was, I just say, say, Neil, come check this out. And you'll just come over and check it out and be like, yeah, like, just keep working. So there's, there's no time wasted with like any middle people. It's just like, so yeah. you get a lot of things done quickly. And we usually work, like, we don't have that, like, there's the last 5% takes like 95% of the time. So we usually stop at 95% or 96% and be like, we gotta just make sure we can get this stuff done. So we'll, like, we won't worry about like finessing every little detail because it's not really that important. Yeah. It's more important to get the whole short looking good as a whole. Isn't that interesting? Because clearly in visual effects and CG, that is important because in a film, people will comment if they don't think it looks right. You know, and yeah, the point yeah. is it's going out there and theatrical release, DVDs and whatnot. But it's kind of refreshing to feel like that's not something you need to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, but why is that? Is it because Neil sees these shorts as pictures, as things to make into a bigger project? Um, why, why do you think you don't need to take it all away? Uh, yeah, I think it's just because he's like, uh, like Neil told me it's like Oats Volume One. It's like imagine like an, an album. Yeah. It's like most directors they only get to produce a couple movies in their entire lifetime. It's like why not? Like they have so many ideas. Why not just like produce a lot of things? So it's like doing these shorts for him was like this album one, and then like Volume Two will be album two. And it's like if you're gonna push everything to 100, percent you might not just not have time to create all these albums. Yeah. And it's like if you make 10 shorts the 10th one might be like, that's the one we need to make a feature film out of this, like, and then you get the best idea out of the bunch instead of just picking the first one and making that one. Yeah, I really like that philosophy. I mean, no one else is really doing that, no. really. There's, there's obviously, and Neil was himself a short filmmaker, yeah. and his shorts led to District 9 and other work. Um, but I, I like the idea that you're just getting it out there for people to comment on. Um, yeah, yeah. But on that note, like one thing that was happening with those shorts, um, Firebase, Zygote, and Raka, was some of the digital assets were available on Steam. Yeah, that's right. What was that like seeing like your asset? Like it was there? it was amazing. Yeah, like people would like send me like renders of the stuff they did at home. Oh really? Yeah, and it's like wow, like people are actually using this stuff. It's nice to. Yeah, has anyone three D printed the yeah. Zygote yet? Yeah, yeah. Oh, have... somebody printed it out. It looks pretty. Cool. This looks amazing. Uh, that's something I'd like to have on my desk, actually. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I made a, a trade with Neil uh, a while back. Uh, so I have to do a portrait of his sister, and he's going to give me a nice, like, printout of the clume, which is all painted oh. and, like, done really well. Nice. So okay. I think... Just give me your address, and I'll come and grab that off yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I think that seems to be part of having this studio in Vancouver is like a lot of talent is in Vancouver now. The yeah. visual effects industry, which generally is pretty young, vi digital visual effects industry generally, you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah. And Vancouver has is, is, um, been doing such great stuff for a while. 
But you've worked there for a while. Tell me about what the industry is like in Vancouver now. I've only worked in Vancouver for three years. Oh, okay. So I was at, I've been at Oats for just over two years now. Yeah. But I yeah I worked at quickly at ILM, which was it was a good learning experience. But it was like they hired me when it's like in full production, so it was a lot of hours. Right. And then I also yep. worked at Scanline, which they also were in full production. That was a lot of hours. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's busy. Like Vancouver is very busy. Yeah. Well, there's just a lot happening, isn't there? And you know, Montreal is also growing as a yeah, that's right. as a place. Um, okay. So, how many people are at Oats? You know, at any given time, does uh, it change? So yeah. the visual effects team at, at its max was tw- like I think 25 people. Yep. So it was like 25 people did all the visual effects for all of us, for all the shorts. But then that doesn't include the practical effects teams oh, and yeah. the cameramen, because everything is done under one roof. Yeah, so in fact, that's probably, I mean, I've been talking about the visual effects side of it, yeah. but that's the most interesting bit really about Oats is that it's go to woe, isn't it? You know, in terms of concepting, story, shooting, yeah, yeah. practical effects. Yeah, like the first day of Oats, like Chris brings me in and he's like, come check this out. And he takes me to the back and there's a tent. He takes me into the tent and I feel like I'm in Vietnam. And he's, he was actually shooting a clip for the first fire, the firebase. Oh, right. And I was like, there's the alien lying on the floor and it's just like, Neil's just looking over it like this. It was quite <laughs> surreal. But yeah, it's like, he was feel, it's like he was shooting in the studio. Yeah. The practical effects were done in the studio and it's like, you can just talk to these people. And yeah, because here's something that I think is really good about that, and that I've been told by a lot of filmmakers and visual effects supervisors, is that young artists coming up don't always have experience, clearly, on a set, or even shooting with like a DSLR, or you know, just understanding filmmaking language, because they some, sometimes hop on the box really quickly and learn 3ds Max. Um, yeah. So clearly, at Oats, you get an opportunity to see more parts of the filmmaking process. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I learned a lot from the practical effects team. Yeah. Like I was, every every day they were working, I would just like go see like, hey, what, what are you guys working on? So I kind of like learn how that process yeah. is too. But do you feel like that actually will go back into your work in terms of things that you're designing and, and modeling? Things you've learned about how things look in reality? Uh, I probably, yeah, probably to a certain degree, yeah. It is different, but. Yeah. I, I also love that um, with those oat shorts, um, people can comment on them online and you know say what they think. What's that like? Is that's actually your work amazing. Here? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the whole like that's the point of oats. Yeah. Because it's like Neil wants to do something like with the audience. It's, they don't. He doesn't want them to be separate. He wants the audience to like. What do you guys want? That's why he did. Th- he did three shorts. Yeah. I think it's like, tell me what you like, and then it's like. Maybe in volume two, we can either make a feature film with this, or we can just keep on doing more shorts and figure something better out. But it's like he wants more interaction with the, yeah. the audience. Which one, <laughs> if you had a choice, which one would you like to see? The Zygote, I think. Yeah. That's my favorite. Okay. Yeah, I, I liked that, obviously. Firebase, I could barely watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there's no, also because it's Neil's project, there's no limit to what you can show, right? In terms of craziness and Yeah, yeah, whatever. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about um, in terms of the tools you were using for Zygote? I think people might be interested in how you actually did that modeling. Uh, so I used to use uh, Maya, Mudbox, and then uh, textured in Mudbox as well, and then just some Photoshop with the textures. Is- yeah. And are they your go-to tools yeah, yeah. for your I portraits prefer. as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I just use what feels comfortable. I know a lot of people use ZBrush, and people say ZBrush would have been better for the Zygote, but I, it's like I, I know how to use the tools I do, so it's yeah. easier for me this way. I've been dying to ask you about the portraits and w- what you feel is a portrait done in CG compared to a portrait done as photography, and also whether and I'm heading down towards this idea of the uncanny valley. Yeah. Um, you know, whether you had that in your mind as you were sort of starting to do these CG portraits, whether you were worried about it at all, anyone saying, oh, that's grotesque, because, you know, the uncanny valley, the idea is as you get closer to reality, it actually starts moving away from reality. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I actually, I really like that challenge. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, with my digital portraits, I was worried about entering that, but it's like, 
I know a lot of people try to, there's different ways you overcome the Uncanny Valley. I think a lot of people try to get like the perfect skin shader, like, yeah. per, like getting the technically perfection. And it's like, I'm not technical. So I'm like, yeah. that's not a path I can take. So I got to figure out how to, another way to get over the Uncanny Valley. So I'm, I base mine more on like uh, inspirations like Rembrandt and Caravaggio. I try and like yeah. relate my work they use the techniques they did to because they're like their portraits like you can see a painting done 200 300 years ago and you can still connect to that person and understand who they are and it's like why can't we do that in digital like digital is a tool it's like we can still we still have the same rules as they did exactly and i was also thinking it's not the same as creating a digital human for a film because here's one thing that happens unless the digital character is in the whole film it goes by quickly yeah a portrait, by definition, is something you sit and look at yeah, for a yeah. while. In fact, I think, I, I mean, I do this with your portraits, is when I can, I zoom in on things. I zoom in on Neil's hands. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, yeah. and it's just, you marvel at the work, I guess. So there's sort of like a different way of looking at them. It's true. Yeah, yeah. like you never do that with a painting. You never get like a microscope and like no. start looking at it. But you do it with digital. Yeah. Almost, it seems weird. Weird, but it's almost to see if there's a mistake. It's or, true. Yeah. Or did he get the ears right? Did he get the eyes right? Yeah, and, yeah. Hey, even if you didn't, it's still interesting to examine it, you know, from a 3D artist's point yeah. of view. Yeah, well, I can guarantee you, like, everything I do is probably wrong anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I was doing an interview with a visual effects supervisor the other day who said he doesn't believe in the Uncanny Valley, at least in terms of maybe film characters. His view was that it either looks right or it doesn't. Yeah. And I think that's right, maybe, for when you are going for photo real human. Yeah, like everybody has a lifetime experience. Like you, since you were born, like you've been looking at a face. Like yeah. you've probably looked at a face more than you have anything else. And it's like, if something is off, you, you just know, you don't need to be an artist to know. Yeah. So it's either, yeah, it's right or it's wrong, really. Exactly. So I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Um, I think we're wrapping up soon here. So what we're going to do is um, head over to the Lenovo Center. But thanks so much, Ian, for Thank joining me. Thank you for me. having it's me. It's been really great chatting.